and it took me less than five minutes to find illegal content. I reported it, but it's no surprise. According to the European Commission, only 42% of illegal content reported on the platforms it was monitoring was removed in the UK. Now that's up from 20% in its first round and a high of 60%, but that's less than half of the illegal content. By April this year, 53 5G masks have been burned down. One Vodafone mask was serving the Birmingham Nightingale Hospital. Now, eventually the kind of COVID related 5G conspiracies of this kind were removed or in some cases covered up with fact checking notifications on social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook, but they still run rampant on other sites like Telegram. The actions offline, the burning down of the masks is illegal, but the conspiracy content is not. Between the 24th and 25th of July, Richard Cowie Jr. posted an average of one tweet every 87 seconds for 12 hours until his account was locked. He gained masses of followers and Twitter indicates he had 306 million impressions across 860 minutes he was online. That's, you know, hundreds of thousands of impressions for each minute that the social media company, in this case, Twitter, failed to act. Even by refined measure, 47 million people saw his tweets, and not all the tweets were anti-Semitic, but there were references to Jewish power, making money from others, comparisons to the Ku Klux Klan, and tensions emerged. I saw some of these firsthand between the black and the Jewish communities. And, you know, there were suggestions that, that if Wiley were arrested, it might lead to, to rioting. There was anger and frustration, you know, suggestions that anti-Semitism is dealt with better than, than other forms of racism. The content wasn't illegal, the potential harms are actually incalculable. So online harms, they percolate our social media, they are vast, they impact everything from democracy, global democracy, to the individual who's scared to leave their you know have reporting systems send acknowledgements to users explain why you have or haven't acted uh, but it was all voluntary it was all on the terms and conditions of the platforms and that rat lack of regulation means it's hit and miss whether a platform acts in good faith there's a lack of consistency. You can find illegal content. And there's no compulsion really to have safety by design, except unless advertisers or perhaps users demand it. Meanwhile, for users, the advice becomes turn off your phone. You know, if you report something uh, to the police, I, I've seen that. I've seen that be given as advice to people. People who are piled on have thousands of it, uh, hateful, um, tweets or, or other social media messages uh, asked to file individual reports. High profile individuals can theoretically uh, abuse others through their account and that hasn't been given much thought. Meanwhile, there are rabbit holes that people get driven down, rabbit holes of hate, where they put more and more harmful material. We are essentially at the whim of companies that are using data, our data, for, to make money. And for charities like mine, it means that we are doing all the work for these platforms again and again and again to their benefit and our detriment. We are teaching them how to work to get through or round or to get to, to avoid this hate on their platform. So I think legislation is the way to go. And I'll finish just by covering what I think should be in it. I love social media. I, I fervently believe, believe in freedom of expression. But, and we can get into this as the chat goes on, there needs to be a regulator in this space. There needs to be a bit of a leveling up. There needs to be a duty of care on platforms so that they address reasonably foreseeable harms on those platforms. And that is all the platforms. I'm not just talking about Facebook or Twitter. I'm talking about Gab and 4chan. I'm talking about Telegram. But those, that duty of care must be underpinned by codes of practice. And it cannot be terms and conditions alone just have terms and conditions, that's fine. It is not. There needs to be education. I'm sure Kate will touch on that. We need to be working on anonymity. I think that should be the platform's problem. 
and there needs to be senior individual management liability for these companies because with Facebook a 650 billion market capitalization and Apple being 2.2 trillion fines aren't just going to cut it that's some of what I, su I suspect we'll be going into today I hope that's a useful overview and uh, Karen I throw it back to you Thank you, Danny. It's a really useful overview and I'm sure there's more you want to share and more that people will have to ask you. Before I ask Kate and Jess to contribute, I am going to ask Jerry, as a young person who uses our social media and who's experienced probably um, the best of it and possibly the worst, to give us his opinions um, and his use. Jerry, you need to unmute yourself. Um, and join us, um, and it's really great to have you on the panel. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jerry Norta Bluer. I'm 18 years old from Newcastle, and I'm proudly a regional ambassador for the Holocaust Educational Trust. Uh, so around about a year ago, uh, I visited the site of Auschwitz-Birkenau with the Trust as part of their Lessons from Auschwitz programme. Uh, for anybody who hasn't been, there isn't more of a powerful reminder that there can be no room for complacency in the fight against both anti-Semitism and all other forms of hate. So since my visit in my role as an ambassador, I've strived to promote values of tolerance and anti-racism within my local community, from organising Holocaust survivors to share their testimony, to writing... A separate reported account which claimed that Judaism is Satanism and that canonized Hitler was described as an account in Instagram's own words that likely doesn't go against their community guidelines. They stressed in the same message, which justified their decision not to remove the account, that as a global community, they understand that people may express themselves differently. Now, if that's their response, what is the point of community guidelines? What is the point even of a report button? Even when our educational conference went online this year, myself and other ambassadors were subject to anti-Semitic comments littered across our social media. It's outrageous and in my opinion and experience it needs more needs to be done about it. I mean, as ambassadors, we do try and remain thick skinned because we know the fight against anti-Semitism and the needs to honour the memory of the victims of the Shoah goes beyond internet bots and trolls. But we do all have our limits. We've tried our very best, but I fear after conversations with fellow ambassadors that we're at the stage now where there's such an acute lack of trust and faith in the institutions of social media platforms to deal with hate that many of us who are frustrated and it's sometimes helpless are losing the will to keep hitting that report button. There are no repercussions for those who preach hate and the ease at which one can create an account on social media in complete anonymity means that it's never long before a bad account is back with a slightly different username. So in my experience, it seems there are three issues to this problem. The anonymity of users, ineffective reporting procedures and structures, and fundamentally at the core, a lack of education over, in, in my case, what, what the nuances of anti-Semitism are today. But looking at the Government Online Harms white paper, it seems there might finally be the appetite to start taking this issue seriously. And I hope the speakers this evening can share their expertise to aid in solving this problem once and for all. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. What an insightful um, response um, that I definitely wouldn't have been able to provide at 18 years old. Genuinely brilliant and really, I think, useful and um, helpful for all of us for the conversation we want to have. Because the fact is, we're not just talking about our own experiences. We are thinking about the next generation and how this impacts them. So Kate um, Green, Shadow Secretary of State for Education, if I can turn to you first to give your uh, reflections. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Karen. Um, like all Labour Party conferences, even a virtual one means that I'm actually multiply booked. So I may have to leave this fringe a few minutes early. It's, um, the fact of being virtual hasn't stopped me believing that I can be in three places at once in defiance of the science. But um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And, and thank you, Jerry, for particularly the remarks you've just made just now, because I agree with you about the three elements you've identified, the anonymity, the absence of regulation and the um, lack of education. But in a way, this isn't new. You know, if you read Victorian um, literature, I quite, I'm rather offensive, the only thing I've got in common with John Major, I think, I like Trollope, uh, you would see that he reports um, a, a great deal of the same sort of thing going on in the print media 150, 200 years ago. The problem is with social media, far more insidious, happens much more privately, um, is much more um, hidden from view, um, and much, much more widely accessible. Well, you know, it has global reach. So um, I think we, we've got a problem that we've had before as humanity, but we've got it at a new scale in a new context today. And I have no real con confidence in such um, regulatory and protective measures that are in place just now. I, um, if I see something abusive on, on social media, um, say on Twitter, I will, if I've got time and, you know, if I'm sufficiently motivated, which quite often I am, I'll... I'll um, click on the report this tweet and then I'll go into the drop down, which is pretty rubbish and gives you three or four not very comprehensive choices um, for why you might be a bit cross about this tweet. You, f you tick one, send it off into the ether. You might get some information back a, a couple of weeks later to say how they responded to your complaint. You have no opportunity to contextualize your complaint, to explain, to educate Twitter and what's wrong with this tweet, why you object to it. Um, it's, it is, I think, very much the platforms are extremely um, let's say fair on this. It's over to you, the user, to notice something, you, the user, to complain about it, and then we'll do something if we feel like it, but there'll be no actual interaction and engagement with you. And I don't think that's good enough. We need a much more um, of a, um, a real sense of obligations, of rights and responsibilities on both Um, you can see it in Hungary, you can see it in Italy and Germany, you can see it around Western democracies, and you can see it in China too. Um, so we need education at every level in society so that people learn not to take fake news at face value, learn to interrogate and question what is presented as fact. I would say that schools and colleges, though, are a very good place where we can do that because we've got, as it were, a captive audience um, and we've got a receptive audience. Young people are genuinely intellectually curious are more apt, I think, to challenge, have less become locked into a set of ways of seeing things than older adults. Um, and so I think that even if um, the older generations are a tougher nut to crack, we certainly shouldn't uh, neglect the opportunity that there is genuinely to engage in schools and colleges with young people um, to judge and evaluate and question what it is that they see on social media. And I think embedding that into our education system is now absolutely crucial and we need to see that being an important element of the online harms legislation when it's brought forward when it eventually is Jess will no doubt say as I would that we seem to have been waiting a very very long time so um, Jerry, I think you're right. This is an opportunity. It's an opportunity we've got to seize with both hands. We've got to grab it. I am concerned that the government will take a narrow, legalistic, what shall we outlaw sort of view of it when there is so much more proactively uh, that we need to be doing. Um, but let us um, collectively together, um, I think we've got a huge opportunity now to make our voice heard, to direct it at this government, to direct it at governments worldwide, to direct it at those multinational, international, global platforms and say to them, um, to use a phrase that's been used in another context recently, enough is enough. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kate. Um, Jess, over to you. So, thank you, Karen, and it's nice to be here with you all. Uh, I suppose I'm going to start with the positive because inevitably these conversations, when I have them, uh, end up very, very grim. <laughs> um, so, I'll start with the positive, and that is that um, I think things have got a little bit better since 
uh, certainly since the first time that I was a victim of hate online. However, like lots of um, violence and abuse and the way that it manifests, the way that it has got slightly better and the way that the platforms have adapted um, is, is simply uh, to, and, and this is the same uh, as if you are often, if you are abused in, um, in, in, in the real world, should I say, although it is very real, the online world, in the real world, and that is that they have come up with new techniques of how to hide the abuse from the victim. So uh, I remember the first time that I was ever properly um, attacked, thousands of messages, uh, you know, I was completely blacked out um by thousands and thousands of people and we spoke to the various platforms about this sort of dogpiling and they made uh, a new i don't know widget i i don't know anything about the technical side of it but they made some sort of new widget that would stop you being having to see the crowd so you might see the occasional thing but you a pile on in that manner wouldn't be allowed to happen uh well it, sorry it would be allowed to happen you just wouldn't see it um, and they, there definitely has been some advancements in filter applications that people can put onto their systems, uh, buzzwords and things. What they have not done at all is stop the perpetration of hate. And so while as an end user, my experience is improved in some regards, the reality is, is that that hate is still being perpetrated and where whilst i might not see the stuff that is aimed at me other people do and the 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 lack of progress around the perpetration and stamping down of this crime in lots of cases or at the very uh, you know at least the very very abusive and offensive behavior um i think just speaks huge volumes and the reason that I think that that is the case is because it is value for money. Make no mistake that big companies uh, make money out of this, not just end users making. So uh, I, I had to demonetize a site uh, of a man who has endless videos about me on Google, uh, on um, YouTube that were all about whether he would or wouldn't rate me and the different ways that he would or wouldn't rate me. And um, he, we managed eventually after years to demonetize his site. Of course, he will just find an alternative, just like Jerry said, it takes five minutes to get a workaround. Um, and uh, we managed to demonetize him. He would have made, I have no idea, thousands of pounds from talking about whether he would or wouldn't rate me. Um, I mean, I wouldn't, you know, maybe you could give me a cut. Uh, it's never offered me any cash. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that if they were to shut down all of those sites, all of the offensive, the people, your 30,000 people that Jerry was talking about, you know, that would hit them in the pocket as well, because they have thousands and thousands of followers. And I think until... The, there is a way to tackle that and face them head on and say that, that they, I mean, like the stop funding hate campaign is very important. Um, but it is, it's about money. watch online content and we don't just need a regulator we need a regulator that has actual teeth to actually do something about it um, and so for me I, I think that one of the that I have noticed is um, as somebody who will have lies spread about them and conspiracies spread about them in order to incite hate. There was recently what was considered by some to be satire. I'm not sure. I, I, I hate it when people say, oh, we're just joking. I, to me, a joke has to be funny. Um, and so often they're, they're not well-crafted. 
as somebody who's a big fan of humour, um, but uh, a satire piece that was a fake Guardian newspaper headline about me um, supporting Shamima Begum and suggesting that I thought basically she was a good egg. Um, and, and the only reason to do that is to incite hatred against me, is to get other people to believe that and attack me. And I have no recourse in the law, really, to take on the anonymous account that did that. Had that been written about me in a newspaper, I could take to people to court. I could, I could do something about it. And so the idea that these sites act as publishers as opposed to just a massive free-for-all is one that I think certainly needs to be explored because as a publisher, you have you know, laws that bind you in what you do. Now, us as users, as somebody who publishes things on, uh, online all the time, uh, every single tweet that you make, you would, you would, as the end user, have to consider yourself as a publisher, as the site is a publisher, and perhaps you'd be slightly more terrified if you thought you were going to have a libel case taken against you. Um, and uh, until we, we sort that, the regulation, and actually which part of the law this sits within i feel that the problem is not going to go away while it's still making money well make well anti-semitism and white supremacy makes money for people like you know the the owners of facebook and twitter and reddit or um, whatever the next thing is going to be i'm already about 20 years behind according to my children um then until they stop thinking that we can coin it in, making terrible hidden anti-vaxxer sites. It was in my constituency, the 5G um, mass that was burnt down, um, and it was horrendous for uh, those few days that we were having, and we had to have police presence. So the taxpayer is footing the bill for the secret, whether it's anti-vaxxers or anti-Semitic 5G, Somewhere along the line, the, ta the British taxpayer is paying for this whilst it's making money for essentially, I'm afraid to say, libertarian college bros who set up companies in a hot bit of America. It's no surprise to me that their rules don't recognise difference and alternative. I mean, Facebook was literally set up to compare which girls were the hottest in a college dorm. So the reality is, is that and, and unless the people who are running these companies feel that it's going to hit them in the pocket, they're not going to do anything about it. And I often hear people saying, oh, well, you know, if we're like Google or if you regulate, maybe we'll leave the UK. And it, 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 it's like gangsterism. Imagine, you know, you know, somebody who is you know, committing crimes, just saying, well, I'm going to leave if you don't, if you don't let me uh, carry on being awful. And they have the capacity and the algorithms to deal with this. If you were to put up something that was a copyright infringement on most of these sites, they would be on you like that. Whereas David Lammy identified on Amazon sh brown shoes using the N word to describe it. How on earth do these fancy people not have an algorithm that can search through whether people have put offensive language onto a site how is that not possible i might not understand the tech but they certainly do and they could be acting on it and they should be acting on it because it is putting people at terrible harm's way thank you jess and funnily enough um just last week i received an email suspending me from twitter because of a copyright issue because i tweeted some exercise video with some music in the background. And I was astonished because I the haste in which they had moved compared to any speed when it comes to actually offensive material, that was what baffled me more than anything else. I mean, it, it was bizarre, and it, but it, it demonstrated very much the mm. point you've just made. Um, Danny, before we go to questions from the audience, and do put your questions um, into that Q&A box if you hover, on the screen because I'm going to be asking uh, the panel um, those questions shortly. I just thought, Danny, it would be useful to touch on two key areas. One, just briefly, just to tell people where we think the bill is up to, i.e. what stage are we at? Um, I, you know, I'd just whatever you're able to give as an overview. 
And secondly, just to begin the question, you said to, um, in your introduction, of course you believe in freedom of expression, as do I, as do I know everybody on this panel. But what, you know, what is that argument of you know, believing in freedom of speech, yet having some form of regulation? I think it's important just to home in on that as well. If you're able to do that, and then audience members, uh, rest assured, I'm then going to be asking your questions, please do say where you're from, if possible, and your name, so I can mention you when I ask a question. Over to you, Danny. Thanks, Karen. And thank you, Kate and Jess and Jerry, for your powerful contributions. I, uh, the, 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 we've had, just so to update people, we had a green paper, we then had a white paper. So this is the kind of pre-legislative uh, process. Um, there were plenty of submissions to that white paper and we had this interim response, which was government saying, we haven't quite got the full response for you yet, um, but we will have in the future. That date for when we were gonna receive the, the full response and the bill has been pushed back and pushed back. The latest rumours going around are that ministers are, are very close to uh, the deadline on, on signing off on that response, uh, but that a bill then won't come until any, any time next year, early next year, could be quarter three next year, I've heard, but 2021 at, at the earliest. Um, now, we were also told there would be what was called light pre-legislative -legislative scrutiny, that may happen at the same time that the white paper response comes out. It's very unclear um, how that will take place, but, but certainly we're not going to see the actual bill until 2021. So that, that's where it stands. Um, ministerial decisions happening around now and then some progress expected, something at the end of this year, bill next year. In terms of freedom of expression, I just think it's completely the wrong argument. There is no freedom of expression on these platforms, right? You don't have the freedom to hear Right, so I don't see everything that people type. It's not directed to me because of the algorithms. And people don't have freedom of speech on the platforms. People aren't allowed to do certain things because of terms and conditions. Now, some platforms obviously differ in terms of what they do let people say. Um, and it's fair to say, as Jess said, you know, there are some companies that have become more responsible in regards of those terms and conditions or those community standards. But it would be like being at, at Speaker's Corner and having somebody surreptitiously cover the ears of half of the people that were listening and maybe even say, oh, look over there, there's somebody else. It doesn't work. It's not freedom of expression. There are rules and regulations. And, and more broadly, as Jess was saying, you know, you cannot go and see a film. There was a film submitted to the British Board of Film Classification called Hate Crime, which was some gangsters breaking into a house and torturing a Jewish family for 90 minutes or so. And the BBFC said, this breaks our rules on discrimination. Actually, we think that the harm caused to society by this film going out is too, too much, too great. And so they didn't allow it to be classified, right? Ofcom regularly prevents things or, or obviously fines for breaches um, in respect of other areas of life. We have consensus in the country about harms. We don't let everything just go. Now, people can have freedom of speech off platform. They have it. They can go and even find other platforms where they might say things that, that I would find objectionable. And I think to an extent, users and the market in respect of advertisers will preference less harmful platforms. But let's not kid ourselves that this is some open space where you get on and say what you want. It is not. It is regulated by the platforms themselves. And what we're saying is that regulation is inconsistent. It's patchy. It's not working. Um, and we need to do better. Thank you. First question I've got, um, Kate, I'll come to you first, if that's okay. Um, and if it's all right with all the panelists, I will come to, um, I won't always come to all of you so we can allow for as much discussion as possible. The first question is, should we only ban illegal content or harmful but legal content as well? Yeah, so this goes to exactly the line I think Danny was talking about a few moments ago. You know, what's the line between free speech, but unpleasant free speech, sometimes threatening or um, vindictive free speech, sometimes with undercurrents of violence or menace? Um, what side of the line does something fall before it remains legal but deeply harmful um, to society as a whole or to some groups within it? Um, and you can't, you know, you can't give a, um, um, there's a very, you can't um, 
abrogate that responsibility of answering that question, but nor can you give a one size fits all question because um, it's a constantly moving dialogue. And we, I think there's some really interesting things. Clive's put a very interesting comment in the, the chat um, about um, the use of a word that, you know, a hundred years ago, nobody would have even thought it fell on the wrong side of the line. And now we would absolutely not consider for one moment that it was acceptable to use it. So um, I think we've, um, got to be constantly alive to what kind of social norms do we consider acceptable and to be vociferous in speaking out when we think they have been breached. So the first thing is not to be silent in the face of being offended. Be, be willing to say, I find this offensive and this is why. And you may not immediately be joined by everyone. You may find plenty of other people will push back and say that's an infringement of my free speech or you're just being oversensitive or you can always just switch it off. But I think we do have an obligation, all of us, when we are offended, to say so, to speak out uh, and to feel confident in supporting others to do that too. Um, secondly, I think we've got to recognise as users that we have um, the right to information and to comment, but we also, that brings with it obligations on us to consider the impact on others. Um, and I think this is, this is a live debate, for example, now on, on university campuses where um, that, you know, I think the government will want to try to legislate, actually. I'm not sure that'll take us very much further forward, to be honest, but um, I think what will take us forward is a genuinely good, open um, and respectful debate. Personally, I can't see why we should want to tolerate anything that's harmful in any medium or on any platform. Um, my absolute preference would be to prevent harmful as well as illegal content um, being posted online. Um, if that means designating harmful as illegal, then maybe that's a route we should look at. Um, I'm, I'm just going to say I'm not a lawyer. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. Um, but um, I think, you know, perhaps what we need to be thinking about here is how do we get the definitions right? But more importantly still, how do we get the public buy-in and a public recognition of the responsibilities that we have as users too? Thank you. Jess, would you like to add anything to that? You're on mute. Okay. Uh, it's difficult because, you know, there, there is satire, there is uh, things that, and people can, um, you know, take offence willfully. Um, and so, and, I, you know, I want to see a world where, frankly, people can take the piss out of me, if I'm perfectly honest. I want, I want people still to be able to do that. But I think that there does need to be some designate of harm, uh, especially when we're talking about the online harms bill. Um, and the, the line, I can't help but think that there's just a common sense line of what you might say to your nan um, or, or your mom. <laughs> like, you know, would your mom like it if you posted this button on Twitter? I think would, you know, go, or, or like a, a function where you could send it to their mom as well um, would be good. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that there are some very clear cut harms where the line lies. It, on illegal activity for a start off. So anything that is talking about raping people, harming people, anything that is racist, anything that would be categorized as hate crime. Unfortunately, our current legislation, for example, um, doesn't define misogyny as a hate crime. And so I think in the area of misogyny, there is potential for it to be much less clear cut currently in the law. And as Kate says, I think that we need to look at what harm is and what constitutes harm in our in other legislation that would be um, around that um, before we can say where exactly where the line is. But what I don't want to do is I, I don't want people to not be able to say that they that they hate me or they don't agree with me or, or frankly to poke fun at me and make a joke at my expense or the expense of because we all do it, don't we? I will say things about my girlfriends and uh, and it's not misogynistic, but it is about context. So I I once um, put up a, somebody once put up a thing on Twitter, um, it was a member of the Labour Party incidentally, um, and they uh, said that I, I, I won't use the swear word, uh, but they basically needed, somebody needed to vigorously have sex with me in order to fix my teeth, uh, to which I reported it to um,
Um, sorry, I had a question I was going to ask you, Danny. Bear with me. I've got a whole list here. Um, yes. So while the online harms bill would punish the companies, how would it deal with the issue of anonymous accounts? Okay. I'll, I'll also, I'd like just very briefly to put a word on the, the illegal versus legal harms as well while, while I'm at it. So I'll do both. On the former, um, the, the duty of care was proposed by a, a very clever guy called uh, Will Perrin and a very clever woman named Lorna, Lorna Woods. And the two of them came up with this duty of care idea, which looks at um, reasonably foreseeable harms. So it addresses the harms before they even manifest. And that means you have the platforms put in place things like, you know, not, not predicting um, harmful returns on your search results. Right. So it doesn't prompt you towards Holocaust denial material or hateful material or, or rape groups or whatever it might be. Um, you build in that safety, you build in taking people away from the harms in advance rather than ha even having to deal with that legal but harmful question. But obviously legal but harmful materials do need to be addressed. I, I talked about that in the in the introduction, you know, uh, and they were addressed in respect of COVID conspiracies. On anonymity, I think there are a couple of different different points to consider. One is, again, it is a reasonably foreseeable harm that there will be people who use anonymous accounts if you give them that facility to attack people. So what as a platform will you do? You throw it back to the platforms and you say, what will you do to stop anonym, anonymous accounts attacking people? Are you going to incentivize anonymity so that, you know, if you post a hateful post as an anonymous account, your IP will be blocked or you will be um, required to add in further details about yourself or whatever it might be. So what can the platforms do? That, that comes from having that kind of risk assessment built in with the duty of care. The other thing I do think that in a similar way that we have in financial services, there should be a know your client principle and it should be possible with appropriate safeguards to provide details of the people who are using your platform. We require it in financial services. We should require it in social media. Now, there will be obviously, you know, victims of domestic violence. There will be whistleblowers. There will be people overseas and they do require protection and that has to be built in. But actually, you know, the same principle should apply. We already have it. Why isn't it being applied to social media? Um, yeah, and I agree with that 100%. Um, I think that the point about on anonymi anonymity is one that we all um, are challenged with. I think it, it just becomes this constant, you know, it, it can't, you can't just have an answer back from a company saying, well, we don't know who it is, or we can't, you know, we can't really deal with this because it's not clear who that person is. And it shouldn't be up to us to find out who they are and then contact them ourselves. Although I know of people who do do that for the genuine purpose of, you know, calling these people to account. I've got a question here from Rebecca and it's to all the panelists. What do you think would make social media, media companies listen so that they, so that they either, sorry, regulate their platforms better or understand the need for external regulation? So really what will make them listen? Who wants to go for that first? I genuinely think it's money is the only thing that will make them listen. Um, so stopping them being able to function. Uh, I mean, they've got, I mean, these companies are bigger than many states in the world. Uh, they are a law unto themselves. But, um, you know, it's, again, to be slightly hopeful, when the uh, abortion referendum happened in Ireland, there was a really, like, good legislation passed about the manner in which online was going to be able to be used politically during that period, and it managed to hold. Um, so there are, there are, you know, if they agree to it, it can happen. Um, and that was done in, uh, in the Republic of Ireland. So that it can be done. Um, but yeah, I think that it's got to be money. So when we find them, you know, it's got to, if, if it was a fine situation, those fines have got to be huge. And when we take a levy from them to fund a regulator, that has to be a, a you know, a levy that they 
feel um because otherwise i think that you know it's going to carry on the the stock funding hate is an interesting model where they have made newspapers ignore the bell i, I don't think there's a vote is there i don't know no it's just random bells constantly um that's the cleaning bell i think to clean the dispatch box between ministers um who famously spread quite a lot of covid in the early days um but um yeah i think that um i've completely forgotten what i was saying but uh yeah the the it, it will have to be a financial uh system otherwise it won't work anybody want to add anything to this we have got lots of questions i should just warn you so if there's nothing if there's anything you want to add feel free otherwise i'm going to keep going i'm going to keep going um jerry i've got one specifically for you um i think it's really about your experience um what you how you have seen anti-semitism manifest itself within your sort of peers online what have you witnessed and have you um, begun to see harmful content become more acceptable, regarded just as bants and, you know, it, some people treating it as light, a light touch rather than seeing the serious, seriousness of it? Um, just maybe shedding a bit of light on that. Yeah, I definitely see it more kind of accepted with my peers, but I do think it's a completely it's like an education issue. So I think a lot of the anti-Semitism that I see on my platforms is, you know, centred around the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and, you know, the, that kind of anti-Semitism that comes from that when people are uneducated about that, that, that conflict. And I, and I don't think it's, it's seen as bants, but I would say it's seen as, well, what is the problem with this? Like when people my age get more involved with politics as they like get older and they get more awareness of the world, I think that that's when I do see on that specific uh, con conflict, uh, anti-Semitism becoming more accepted within my, my age group. But like I said, it's an education issue, and that's why pretty much I'm an ambassador is to you know put, try and re-educate. Thank you. And then to continue from that, and Kate, um, I suppose this is going back to your introductory comment. Rebecca from Socon Trent asks, how do you all think that hatred in society, which is behind the hatred spouted online, can be eradicated? Um, this person, Rebecca, is a secondary school teacher, um, and she says, as a teacher, the society my students are growing up in is concerning, and I worry for their mental health as a result. So part of the reason for the anger and hate is, of course, the um, socioeconomic context that we're in. You know, it's not surprising when people feel economically insecure, when they're fearful, um, of the future when they're under huge pressure uh, that they, they look for someone to scapegoat and to blame. And um, social media, digital platforms give them a, an outlet for that and for spreading their fear and the way their fear translates into um, hatred much, much more easily and widely. Um, so part of um, addressing this climate of scapegoating and hate is to improve the lives of everybody, particularly to improve the lives of those who feel most marginalised and excluded. And it's why um, tackling poverty, tackling inequality, ensuring that everyone um, has a safe home to go to, um, has um, the means to support themselves and their families, um, is able to access the public services that they need and feels that they're treated with respect and dignity, um, is going to be part of the answer to that. But there's no doubt that we are being manipulated by, and Jess is right, some of this is about big money, money that is being made out of um, fermenting and ex and extending hate. And it's, it's, it's not just about money, though it's also about power. Um, and you know we are seeing autocrats, despots, dictators, even in so-called developed democracies, we are seeing this form of power being misused. Um, and that too, I think, is fostering hate. So coming right back to where Rebecca is in, in school, um, I do think that empowering our young people to to identify this when it's happening, to identify this manipulation and, and of emotions and relationships and the reasons, the, the, um, the, the motives behind it is a, a really important part of educating young people to become authoritative, confident, um, empowered citizens. Um, 
that doesn't offer you, Rebecca, an instant answer because I don't think there is an easy answer. And I suppose the other thing I'd just say we've really learned about the fermenting of hate is that good people have to speak out against it. If good people stay silent, hate flourishes. Certainly something that chimes with those of us um, who felt we've had to speak out a lot on this um, for considerable time. Um, there's a question here um, also about influencing and educating people that I think, I hope whoever asked it, I haven't got your name, but I think Kate does sort of address that and did earlier about being more willing just to call things out. But Danny, there's a question I think I should put to you, but I'm more than happy to open it to the panel, which is, is the IRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism workable for tackling hatred on social media. Danny, if you can just explain what the definition is and then give your point of view, if that's okay. Yeah, I'll do that briefly. I also, while we still got Kate, I think she's absolutely right on education. The regulator um, in the government's white paper, they said they were gonna uh, introduce an online media literacy strategy, um, which we haven't seen yet. And so there's a great way to go in terms of understanding what the plans are for this area and how how this education is going to happen and it's education on the other side as well for judges the judiciary for police to understand how platforms work on the ira ihra international holocaust remembrance alliance is an organization that it, well, it was actually its predecessor came up with a definition of anti-semitism which was in response to uh concerns about anti-semitism and people fleeing europe um, for safety because of a rise in anti-Semitism. They have a short definition uh, which goes alongside and is integral uh, or has a number of uh, definition, definitional points which are integral to the definition, right? And the definition explains what anti-Semitism is given an, a, a particular incident's context. It's all about context. Something may be anti-Semitic in a particular context. Now, there are calls, the Board of Deputies, for example, is calling for the regulator to adopt this IRA definition of anti-Semitism. The, the IRA definition was never designed to be uh, put into legislation. It's a working definition because anti-Semitism changes and is flexible. I do think it's a, a very helpful document, but it's not a panacea. And so I think that in respect of the bill, that wouldn't be the right place. Might a regulator adopt it down the line, potentially? Is it workable for the social media companies? Actually, if you take a, a Facebook, for example, they actually do capture a lot of the IRA definition already. There will be difficulties for them in applying, let's say, the double standards on Israel example, which comes under there. Um, but, you know, it is all about context. So might they be able to do that? Well, yes, they might. I mean, I, I've, heard, I've heard it both ways. It's certainly, I don't think it's a right for the bill. I do think there is discussion. I do think the regulator ultimately should adopt it. And I think we can have a discussion about social media companies and its roles with, with them. Does anybody want to add to that? Or do you feel that's quite a, that's quite a definitive, yeah. Okay, response from Danny. And um, I've got so many questions here. And Kate, I think we've got you for another 10 minutes. So I'm going to keep you um, and Jerry actually for this question. Um, so, Jerry, you've talked about your experience of uh, what's coming up amongst young people online. I suppose the question here, I'm summarizing, um, I've got a lot here, but what kind of, edu what kind of educational outreach will resonate with young people? online what do you think and then i think that's good for kate to hear um and if kate has anything she'd want to add to that yeah so i think a lot of it even though this might seem like a like a chicken out to the answer is schools i just think that there's so many issues that are relevant to, to anti-semitism online that could be brought up in schools because when you seek education from online that's such a subjective choice about where you go to be educated on a, on a specific issue about where you go about what is anti-semitism or what isn't and even within the jewish community there can be some kind of uh, diverse views on what is and what is anti-semitism so i think we need an objective source of education and i think for me the only thing that i can think of that would be schools okay thank you and kate 
Yeah, I agree with Jerry. I mean, almost all children go to school. Um, so we should take advantage of that opportunity uh, to educate and, and allow discussion and questioning so that children can explore the things they feel uncertain about and feel that they are in a safe space to ask those questions, but that they know that when um, the class is over, the learning is over, that they will be clear about boundaries that should not be crossed. Um, I also think that we don't need to start late on in schooling. Very little children have a great interest actually in moral questions. Um, they often see moral questions much more simply and clearly than um, those of us who are older do. And I think they, they really welcome the opportunity to think about their relations with others and the obligations that children owe and adults owe to one another and adults owe to children. Um, I've seen, I was talking about this in an earlier fringe, and I'm not suggesting it's the answer specifically to the question we're talking about here, but in, um, in schools that have adopted the rights-based model, the UNICEF rights respecting model, where you really equip children to think about their interests interactions with their obligations to and the obligations they can expect from others, you can empower very, very little children um, from a, a sort of values base to think about um, exactly how do you equip them to respect others and to, to um, understand the need to recognise everybody's rights. Um, so I agree with, uh, with Jerry. School is a great place to start this. Infant school is not too soon, in my opinion. There are ways of starting this education very, very early. I think if we're going to wait until um, we're dealing with young adults on university campuses, um, we're probably starting way, way too late. Here, am I unmuted? Yes. Um, thank you. I mean, something I would just add to this um, in terms of understanding the framework of education. The one challenge I think we've got is, for example, you know, a lot of people think that because we teach about the Holocaust and it's on the curriculum and even those who don't have to follow the national curriculum, who follow the spirit of the curriculum, still include Holocaust education. People think that as a result, they understand what anti-Semitism is. And I'm afraid that isn't always the case. Because what they learn about in Holocaust education is very briefly what anti-Semitism looked like before the Holocaust. And then a specific uh, form of anti-Semitism, which is, you know, soldiers in, you know, Nazi soldiers in jackboots marching down the street. And very obvious propaganda that we all know of, you know, hook-nosed Jews and money bags and whatever else, which again, we can easily identify. I think what we've known, um, noticed certainly over the past few years is that absolute mixing of language, whether it's calling, you know, a Jew a Zio as an abusive term, or calling a Jewish person a Zionist as if it's abuse, not understanding the uh, meaning of Zionism. And those are things that are not talked about, certainly not in Holocaust education, and bearing in mind curriculum time, but aren't actually taught about in school. And I think something, I, sorry, I'm going, I'm taking my chair hat off, and talking solely as chief exec of, ha of ET. But I think it's important, I think it has to be understood that if you really want to get to the nuance of some of the things that Jerry's referring to, to really understand the different strands of what anti-Semitism looks like, there needs to be time to discuss it and identify it, as well as earlier when Jerry talked about discussion around uh, issues around Israel-Palestine, the fact that that conversation can so easily enter into sort of anti-Semitic discourse when it shouldn't raises the question of how these conversations are being had and what people understand about geopolitics but also how they use their language etc so it, this is a big question that can't be answered in in you know in one nugget can I've I got... say one other thing on this Karen um, and it's similar to the conversations I've been having with the campaigners for um, the black curriculum and uh, mainstreaming black history into into schools um, I don't think you do this on its own. You you mainstream it into all everything that happens in school. You if if you're having if you're having a maths lesson, and um, uh, that is an opportunity to talk about the history of of different mathematicians, their backgrounds, their experience, what happened. And if you're having a music lesson, an art lesson, I do think that um, we we tend to we often think that these sort of citizenship stroke um, public um, pol you know political stroke. Um, um, social education issues are done on a, you know, on a wet Thursday afternoon for three quarters of an hour, um, mixed up with a whole lot of other stuff about sex and relationships and how to open a bank account. Um, we really need to mainstream it into all of the, the school curriculum and the way that the whole learning experience genuinely um, 
educates people in and challenges anti-Semitism um, and indeed um, that, that's a big challenge I think for schools and for educators but it's, it's a really important thing for us to think about doing. Um, I agree and I think you know whole school approach generally in these scenarios is all is the best way to, to, to really to carry that through. Um, this is a question from Alan from Leeds. Uh, to all the panel, I'm gonna go to Jess first. How flexible is the online harm bill to ensure it is a catch all as many bills that become acts of parliament soon become outdated? Those that wish to hate will always find an alternative way of getting their message across, especially when a good amount comes from abroad where legislation has a higher threshold, particularly in the US, where lots of hate is protected by the First Amendment. Are you, are you grateful to me to coming to you first? Yeah, very, very grateful. Um, the, the answer is, is the bill will, will inevitably, uh, like to be fair, almost all bills in Parliament have to be amended and changed uh, as things changed. Uh, you get the great pleasure of sitting on lots of statutory instruments uh, to change bills. Uh, when you're a member of parliament there's no one de definitely nobody told me about that before I became one uh, I might have con reconsidered my position um, but um, it the, the truth is is that the bill we don't actually know what it will say and I imagine in truth that it will be drawn quite narrowly um, that is the, the there is a big risk to any government legislation that if you make it general and try and build it to be a have a broad base um is that what that, that we we call it like it'll be turned into a christmas tree and you know backbenchers who have got their thing will somehow be able to get their hobby horse into a quite vague bill so we'll have to wait and see exactly um what is presented when it finally comes um but keeping up with how things change has got to be part of the bill. There's all sorts of clauses that you can put into bills that are sunset or sunrise clauses that come into action. You can you can write uh, pilots into law um, and things like that. So I imagine it will have to be in incredibly flexible. And as for dealing with things from abroad, I mean, the reality is, is that we are the in receipt of the providers, internet providers in this country. Um, and so, you know, what happens in this country is what we can legislate for. And, um, and surely they must be able to make it so that we can't see it. Thank you. And um, just to share with you all, as you know, Kate had to leave early. So she's left the call, but she's very grateful to all of you for having joined us. Just to say to you, we have probably just over 10 minutes, maybe a little more, um, and I already have a queue of questions. So if you've got any other burning questions, get them on the chat now. Danny, do you want to offer any opinion on that particular one? Yeah, very briefly. Um, the, the, the point is that at the moment, there is nothing. And the bill will, will, if it goes as expected, create a regulator. And at least, in my view, with a regulator there, you can build expertise, you can start to follow trends. There will be the option for these, what they're calling super complaints. So organizations will be able to bring complaints to the regulator, uh, a kind of aggregated complaint. That is all things that cannot happen at the moment. And so that, that provides a kind of appropriately so that we can get the right action at the right time but flexibility the regulator will help in dealing with those trends as they come thank you i've got a question here from gorinda i agree with the need for legislation however many disputes cases we see are of labor party members sharing harmful content specifically online does the panel have ideas about what else we can do in relation to members sharing harmful content? So this is about the Labour Party 
not only about wider legislation. So I think, Jess, we have to come to you for that. Fair enough. Um, I mean, look, I think that we have to have zero tolerance of these things. And what I cannot understand that has gone on over the past uh, number of years is that disputes cases rumble on for what seems like forever uh, in, in cases of anti-Semitism, of uh, racism, of sexism um, and of aggression and violence. Um, and, you know, I I just think that it needs to be a much quicker and much more clear-cut process, especially when there is something written down. I understand it might be difficult in CLP meetings, the, 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 the he said, she said, you know, those things, but there still has to be an environment to deal with those sorts of things. But when online stuff is shared, you know, there, there, there is a real need to have very, very quick action around that. Having said that, I do believe that people um, need to be given the opportunity of a, a way back, a, a, an education. I think that there is lots and lots of, um, of the language and the nuance that um, Karen was talking about um, in, in people, you know, not talking correctly about it, the Israel-Palestine conflict. Everyone's a bloody expert. You know, nobody, very, very rarely do I get hate that is associated to the Kashmir um, conflict uh, where Indians uh, and Pakistanis in my community are having a pop at each other online. That just, it just, it doesn't happen in the same manner that when we talk about the Israel-Palestine conflict. And so I do think that, you know, if the Labour Party can put in place really good education for CLPs, really good courses for CLPs, then that should, you know, if people are uh, have the wrong views um, or are have the potential to get something really badly wrong, then at least we've given them the opportunity to say, well, you could have had the training at the very least. Okay, thank you. I'm going to combine two questions uh, from Shireen. Um, first of all, just saying, you know, listening to Kate makes me reflect on the lack of consensus about what is harmful. I'm thinking especially of the discussion of women's sex-based rights. How would we go about drawing reasonable lines within and beyond the labour and trades union movement? And just hold that in your thoughts because there's a similar but not the same question from Alf Dubs, who I'm delighted is on our call. Women in public life get this hostility much more, much worse than men. But I get quite a few comments like, a pity you survived the Holocaust. Is that free speech or unacceptable? So actually, these, these aren't combined questions, but they sort of are because they're, it's, <laughs> It's, a, you know, I think they're probably the two most common, um, uh, they have a commonality, which is it's, a, it's directed at you, the person, and what you represent, right? And undermining it in some way. Um, Jess, should I come to you first? Mm -hmm. Feel free. Uh, for a start off, I'd just like to answer Alf's question. It is totally unacceptable. <laughs> um, without question, it is unacceptable. Um, I, I, I actually, you know, in the nuance, is it free speech? I actually think that that one is particularly clear cut. It is completely and utterly unacceptable. And it is done directly to specifically target Alf, his identity and his experience. So it is personal amongst other things. And I suppose moving to the, the um, issue of sex-based rights, I would say the same metric should be applied. Um, if there is... Uh, somebody, uh, I saw Heather Pito, who is a brilliant trans rights activist and uh, Labour Party member, talking, it wasn't actually from within the party, um, uh, it was, uh, she was talking about how she had been specifically targeted people like putting up her address and things. Um, if you are attacking an individual on the basis of their identity, then, well, you, you know, you're doing something wrong, regardless of what that identity is if you are attacking them based on their identity and their experience in order to cause harm then you you definitely have crossed the line it is harmful etc 
Um, but, you know, there, there has got to be, uh, like I said, I want people to take the mick out of me. I want people to debate with me. I want people to challenge me and question my perceived wisdom because sometimes it changes, not very often, but quite actually sometimes. Um, and I think that, you know, that there is a, a, a um, you know, the, the conversation around women's sex based rights in the Labour Party, I think, is one that should be able to be had without anybody feeling that anybody else has caused them harm personally. And, and if that's not the case, then we're poorer for it. ...into the mix, because it follows on from uh, Alf Dove's question. Um, it's an opportunity for Jerry. Um, I'd like to come to you first, Jerry. And then Danny, if it's all right with you, for you to offer your opinions on those two other questions, this one that I'm about to ask and any final comments you want to make before we um, finish off. So um, the question is whether Holocaust denial should be banned online, i.e. is it a form of incitement? Is it uh, incitement of hatred against Jews? Um, obviously, I've got quite a clear opinion on this, but I think that um, it would be good to hear from Jerry as somebody who I think also probably has witnessed some of this online himself. And Danny, how that would fit again in this framework that we're talking about in the online harms bill. So, Jerry, first of all, over to you. Yeah, I think we probably have the same opinion on it, if I'm being honest, Karen. But I think it relates to what kind of Jess had to say as well is that when we talk about free speech, free speech is provides provisions to, to exchange ideas in a productive way about any issues. But when you cross that line, to, to, to personal things and you, you talk about personal harm that that free speech doesn't give you a free pass on that and it's the same with holocaust denial you can't debate the murder of six million jewish women and children you just can't it's not that isn't an area where free speech provides provisions for you to debate that because it's it can't be debated it's it's fact and and i think you only have to engage with jewish groups to realize how incredibly anti-semitic it is to do that anyway so it, it uh, yeah, I don't think it should be tolerated in a way. It's not productive to debate to debate at all. Is there anything else you want to add, Jerry? Just as final remarks, it's fine if not. But I just thought, bearing in mind the debate that you've heard, if there's anything else you wanted to say, uh, I just think here in the debate, like from from to the like point of view, it's clear that this legislation might go through, it might work, it might not. I'm not an expert on it, if I'm being honest, but it really shows to me how important education is and in kind of multiple walks of life about combating anti-semitism combating hate um and it's just very important to me and i think it should be very important to everybody else so yeah thanks jerry over to you danny sure um okay do, doing those questions in, in reverse uh, holocaust now this is my, with my trust hat on should be banned on on facebook uh, it shouldn't be allowed there is no debate on Holocaust denial, Deborah Lipstadt, you know, said there is no opposing side. The Holocaust happened. End of. Now we've actually taken this to Facebook, as have many others, and said, you know, you need to do something about this. We've got a publication coming out tomorrow which explains that uh, Holocaust denial isn't just bad in of itself. It has impacts on the people that post it. It has uh, impacts on our democracy. And um, people will have to look to our, our Twitter anti sem policy tomorrow to see that and see some of the impacts that Holocaust denial has. But it is an anti Semitic ideology. So I don't think it should be on any social media platforms. More broadly, however, the, the act, the, the, oh, sorry, the bill, the, the way that it's envisaged, there will be this duty of care. The duty of care uh, and the code of practice underneath it are systems level. So they don't deal with individual bits of anti-Semitism or individual bits of, of Islamophobia or, or, or sexism, what they do, do do is they ensure that the platforms build their, their product for safety. As I was saying before, that they, have, they don't have algorithms that track towards those harms, right? They have to have appropriate terms and conditions, and then they have to have reporting systems for those terms and conditions. And I think there will be, as I say, users will prompt the platforms to do more and more and more. The, 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 the issue is though, this is all systems level. There will be the chance to bring these super complaints when there are particular issues that arise, but the platforms themselves have to be responsible. They have to have appropriate terms and conditions. They have to have appropriate community standards. And uh, part of that 
and I think this should be part of the, the codes of practices, that they have to have um, uh, regulation around protected characteristics, right? There are protected characteristics that we have in this country um, that are very clearly spelled out in, uh, and, it, and it is something that those platforms need to make sure their terms and conditions address. In terms of just, just final comment, Karen, I, I would say, uh, you know, we've all said it, education is absolutely key. Um, we, the trust has done some videos, which are on our website. Um, I know you have plenty of educational materials and it, and it relies on good actors going out there and voicing their concerns and taking on this hate directly until we get to the stage where the bill is brought in and we have a helping hand. But until that point, you know, people have to have to come out, speak out, challenge the hate where they see it. And uh, hopefully we'll have a good bill, a strong bill, a robust one, uh, and something that can help us all as we move forward into this new uh, technological and developing digital world. Thank you. I mean, anecdotally, and Danny, you're aware of this story, but a few years ago, um, a daughter of a Holocaust survivor came to us very upset because her account on Facebook had been suspended. Um, what had happened was that she'd seen somebody denying the Holocaust on Facebook. She'd challenged them by uh, using uh, quite a raw imagery of the victims of the Holocaust. Now, some of those images were of uh, nude bodies. And the result was nudity being an offense was therefore meaning that she was suspended, but the Holocaust denier was not. And when she tried to uh, engage with Facebook about why they'd got it wrong, she got absolutely nowhere. I mean, this was a few years ago, but if you think about how that person felt, the daughter of a survivor tried to defend the truth that her father had been through, who was still alive, um, it's horrifying. And it's, I think, these sorts of personal challenges that people have that just shouldn't be so difficult. Um, I'm aware of the time. Jess, is there anything you want to say as final remarks? Um, I, mean, I would just say that we have to, you know, we, we, we have lots of things in our law that rely on the, the, you know, the proving of intent. And in all of this, if the intent is to harm, and in, with regard to Holocaust denial, the intent of Holocaust denial is simply to gaslight a community and to, um, and to, to make them suffer. Um, that there is no other reason to do it. Um, and so if we, cannot, if we cannot be grown up enough online to work out where the intent is good, where the intent is debate and where the intent is hate, then we don't deserve, they should switch the internet off, frankly, if you, that cannot be made clear, legislated for, regulated and sorted out. Absolutely. Um, I should have mastered Zoom by now, but you know, we still have our moments. Um, I want to first of all thank uh, this brilliant panel, Jerry, Jess, Danny, and of course Kate Green, who um, had to leave just a bit earlier. I want to thank the Anti-Semitism Policy Trust um, and the Holocaust Educational Trust um, organizers for bringing this event together. I want to apologize to those who've asked questions that we didn't get to. I can't quite believe we're already nearing 20 past five, but that was a really useful and important discussion and it's an ongoing one. I think, how can you conclude this? It, it, it's something that we are challenged with every day, but I think there's clearly consensus that we recognize that there's a problem. We can see some steps for a solution um, from government, from companies, frameworks, legislation, but also we talk a lot about personal responsibility. And without going into it, certainly Jess, you alluded to it, and as did Kate and as did I earlier, but you know, we know more than most about personal responsibility. We on this call all understand about our individual roles and the difference we can make, the voice that we have, the role we can play, and actually, we have to value that and recognize it and use it because otherwise it's just as much on our shoulders as it is at those that we're pointing at. Um, you know, we can't necessarily uh, change the anti-Semites. We can't change the misogynists. 
maybe. We can't change the extremists, but what we can do, the decent people who are the majority can make a tangible difference, but it is very much on our heads. It's for us to do. Um, so just really a deep, um, heartfelt thanks from me to all of you for joining and to our brilliant panel and look forward to seeing you soon. Bye.